Down 5 without the ball and under 20 seconds left in the 4th, Steph picks off this Jokic skip pass to the left corner, Smitty moves to shed the half court trap before pulling up for the drift in in traffic triple 2 point game. 2 missed free throws from Denver were followed by the dubs running in iso where Curry gets the step to his left past Reggie but bricks a relatively wide open off handed bunny. While the dubs were mostly in control of their own fate, after this Chris Paul missed 3, Aaron Gordon stepped out of bounds right here but it went uncalled according to the NBA's last two minute report. Before that, a clear foul on one of the only superstars who never flops also went uncalled as Gordon's completely out of position. The play right before that, a clear goaltend by Aaron Gordon was called a clean block. That's a sketchy density of Mile High City benefit of the doubt from the officials given the missed calls occurred in such close proximity. They'll have to let go of a tough L, but with all NBA defenders in Draymond and GP2 potentially back for the Cavs matchup at Chase Center on Sunday, vibes for Dub Nation have the chance to pick right back up. Stay tuned for how TJD fared on Jokic and a lot more. But just 10.5% of you are subscribed, so press subscribe and turn on notifications if you haven't already, and splash thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. Give credit to Denver though, whose starting five was night and day better than Golden State's, as the Dub's first unit continued to struggle. The effort level from Klay Thompson Andrew Wiggins and Kevon Looney has to be more consistent on both ends. KT, Wiggs, and Loondog have to be more prepared to effectively get it done when the ball swung their way, and also be 10 times more active on the defensive glass, boxing out, and securing clean rebounds. Next to Jokic, who was constantly drawing fouls, posting up like a man possessed, and generally controlling the tempo with 35, 13, and 6, Reggie Jackson stepped up for the injured Jamal Murray with 3 triples, 20 points, and 6 dimes. Number 1 rated player out of Nathan Hale and Michael Porter Jr. was there for timely daggers all game as well, pouring in 3 triples, a team 3rd best 17 points, which included a nasty left-handed putback jam. Back to the dubs and for Trace Jackson Davis, he was one of five fellow bench players with a positive plus minus and showed you the lob threat he can be by thunderously rolling to the cup to connect with Curry for this and one. He had moments of being overwhelmed with the Jokic matchup defensively, getting scored on multiple times, but I thought generally the kid held his own. Sharing that opinion is Klay Thompson, Steph Curry, and even Serbian Superman himself, Nikola Jokic. Clay gave some praise to Trace after the Denver L, saying, He's going to be in the NBA a long, long time. He's ready. He's able right now. What a steal we got late in the second. He's going to be a huge help for us all year. Meanwhile, give credit to Nikola Jokic, who was classy towards his rival center, saying Trace quote-unquote doesn't look like a rookie. And for Steph, Curry heavily detailed how the Rook fared against Joker, saying he did great, Jokic is a beast, he averages whatever he averages across the whole league, it's tough to stop him, you just try to make him work. After the first possession where he spun baseline and they called a foul, I think he kind of understood angles and just being ready to play, and then making him guard on the other end too. That's what Trace can bring us on both ends of the floor. Lob and one, got to the free throw line a couple times in the second half, made a transition layup where he's putting pressure on their entire team at the rim. He plays with confidence and will understand the nuances of arguably the best center in the league right now, arguably him and Joel. It's a tall task and I think he did a great job. Steph, Nicola, and Clay's remarks are backed up by the analytics as well, as the dubs rookies in the aforementioned 57th overall pick Trace Jackson Davis to go along with the 19th overall pick in Brandon Pojemski are currently 2nd and 3rd respectively in plus minus among first year pros. The valued rookie vibe enhancers will be getting more reps in Santa Cruz after being an option for a second time in as many weeks before likely returning to the team for Sunday's outing versus Cleveland. From a coaching standpoint, the trust of TJD was encouraging, but whether or not that'll keep up and increase like it very well should when your top power forward and Draymond's active remains to be seen. Nevertheless, it's evident when Jackson Davis is out there, he's the Warriors' clear-cut most effective center. However, the politics behind him being a rookie get in the way of him playing the most minutes at that position on the team. Seeing how the deck is shuffled by the coaching staff will be interesting. 
while Steve picked up a tech in the L, he rightfully made the refs hear about it for whistling a foul on a clear flop from Jokic, as despite the rule change to make selling contact a technical foul, a problem with refs remains calling fouls on all types of self-manufactured gimmicks, from lean-ins to the plays where a guy stops short on a pull-up with a defender falling back, to ghost flails like so many have become famous for, flopping is still out of control, and officials around the NBA have some major, major cleaning up to do. My best advice to the men or women in white and black would be to get the correct angle on your assigned baseline and judge the actual contact. Instead of going off the player's reaction, it would make the games a lot more fun to watch, if that was the case. One of the underlying themes creeping up amidst this 23-24 campaign for the Golden State Warriors is Steve Kerr and Klay Thompson not having been extended by new GM Mike Dunleavy. They'll both be free agents in 2024 if an agreement on an extension isn't met by June 31st. There's still plenty of time, but the last reports regarding a Thompson extension were that Klay and management were far apart on a deal, with Klay sharing a strong message on Instagram with Tupac's Me Against the World playing and a caption that read, the type of energy I'm on all season. For Kerr, last reports about a new deal were from Josh DeBow of the Associated Press in late September, stating that management had expressed a desire to get a contract extension, and Kerr's confident something will work out, even if it doesn't happen before the start of the season. We talked about another elephant in the room in my last vid, but Steve and Clay not being locked down long term is another one. Of course, Joe Lacob and Mike Dunleavy have to think about the future, and they're looking to see if Thompson and Kirk can prove their worth into their later years with the organization. In my opinion, these two should have had their contracts extended around the same time as Draymond's, because you have a Stephen Curry in prime condition at about to be age 36, and you can't afford to play games with this year's chemistry. Extensions for Kerr and Thompson could and should be on their way, because you need the 100% commitment from Steve and Clay in order to have a championship culture. If it comes to the point where the Thompson cap hit looks bad in a few years, you cross that road when you get there. For now, it's about maximizing the potential of 2024 with how well Curry's playing. So lock Thompson and Kerr down. But should the dubs extend Thompson and Kerr in your opinion? Let me know for a chance at next video shout out and to compete in community speech. Today's shoutout goes to Greg King, who says the Warriors absolutely need TJD to be ready to contribute by the playoffs. He needs a consistent rotational role, maybe 10 minutes a game until he learns, then gradually build him up to 20 minutes. He's exactly what they need physically. Size, motor, athleticism. And he's their only insurance against injury. Now if we can only get Kerr to play him. Totally agree with you on that one, Greg. Thanks for every take. d signing off.